The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 6 A Hideous Crew The war canoe with its savage load moved slowly toward the break in the reef through which it must pass to gain the open sea. Tarzan, Mugambi, and Akut wielded the paddles, for the shore kept the west wind from the little sail. Sheeta crouched in the bow at the ape-man's feet, for it had seemed best to Tarzan always to keep the wicked beast as far from the other members of the party as possible since it would require little or no provocation to send him at the throat of any than the white man, whom he evidently now looked upon as his master. In the stern was Mugambi, and just in front of him squatted a cut, while between a cut and Tarzan the twelve hairy apes sat upon their haunches, blinking dubiously this way and that, and now and then turning their eyes longingly back toward shore. All went well until the canoe had passed beyond the reef. Here the breeze struck the sail, sending the rude craft lunging among the waves that ran higher and higher as they drew away from the shore. With the tossing of the boat, the apes became panic-stricken. They first moved uneasily about, and then commenced grumbling and whining. With difficulty a cut kept them in hand for a time, but when a particularly large wave struck the dugout simultaneously with a little squall of wind, their terror broke all bounds, and, leaping to their feet, they all but overturned the boat before a cut and Tarzan together could quiet them. At last calm was restored, and eventually the apes became accustomed to the strange antics of their craft, after which no more trouble was experienced with them. The trip was uneventful. The wind held, and after ten hours' steady sailing, the black shadows of the coast loomed close before the straining eyes of the ape-man in the bow. It was far too dark to distinguish whether they had approached close to the mouth of the Ugambi or not, so Tarzan ran through the surf at the closest point to await the dawn. The dugout turned broadside the instant that its nose touched the sand, and immediately it rolled over, with all its crew scrambling madly for the shore. The next breaker rolled them over and over, but eventually they all succeeded in crawling to safety, and in a moment more their ungainly craft had been washed up beside them. The balance of the night the apes sat huddled close to one another for warmth, while Mugambi built a fire close to them over which he crouched. Tarzan and Sheeta, however, were of a different mind, for neither of them feared the jungle night, and the insistent craving of their hunger sent them off into the stingy and blackness of the forest in search of prey. Side by side they walked when there was room for two abreast, at other times in single file, first one and then the other in advance. It was Tarzan who first caught the scent of meat, a bull buffalo, and presently the two came stealthily upon the sleeping beast in the midst of a dense jungle of reeds close to a river. Closer and closer they crept toward the unsuspecting beast, Sheeta upon his right side, and Tarzan upon his left nearest the great heart. They had hunted together now for some time, so that they worked in unison, with only low, purring sounds as signals. For a moment they lay quite silent near their prey, and then, at a sign from the ape-man, Sheeta sprang upon the great back, burying his strong teeth in the bull's neck. Instantly the brute sprang to his feet with a bellow of pain and rage, and at the same instant Tarzan rushed in upon his left side with the stone knife, striking repeatedly behind the shoulder. One of the ape-man's hands clutched the thick mane, and as the bull raced madly through the reeds the thing striking at his life was dragged beside him. Sheeta but clung tenuously to his hold upon the neck and back, biting deep in an effort to reach the spine. For several hundred yards the bellowing bull carried his two savage antagonists, until at last the blade found his heart, when with a final bellow that was half scream he plunged headlong to the earth. Then Tarzan and Sheeta feasted to repletion. After the meal the two curled up together in a thicket, the man's black head pillowed upon the tawny side of the panther. Shortly after dawn they awoke and ate again, and then returned to the beach that Tarzan might lead the balance of the pack to the kill. When the meal was done, the brutes were for curling up to sleep, so Tarzan and Mugambi set off in search of the Ugambi River. They had proceeded scarce a hundred yards when they came suddenly upon a broad stream, which the negro instantly recognized as that down which he and his warriors had paddled to the sea upon their ill-starred expedition. The two now followed the stream down to the ocean, finding that it emptied into a bay not over a mile from the point upon the beach at which the canoe had been thrown the night before. Tarzan was much elated by the discovery, as he knew that in the vicinity of a large watercourse he should find natives, and from some of these he had little doubt but that he should obtain news of Rokoff and the child for he felt reasonably certain that the Russian would rid himself of the baby as quickly as possible after having disposed of Tarzan. He and Mungambi now righted and launched the dugout, though it was a most difficult feat in the face of the surf which rolled continuously in upon the beach. But at last they were successful, and soon after were paddling up the coast toward the mouth of the Ungambi. Here they experienced considerable difficulty in making an entrance against the combined current and ebb tide, 
but by taking advantage of eddies close into shore, they came about dusk to a point nearly opposite the spot where they had left the pack asleep. Making the craft fast to an overhanging bough, the two made their way into the jungle, presently coming upon some of the apes feeding upon fruit little beyond the reeds where the buffalo had fallen. Sheeta was not anywhere to be seen, nor did he return that night, so Tarzan came to believe that he had wandered away in search of his own kind. Early the next morning the ape-man led his band down to the river, and as he walked he gave vent to a series of shrill cries. Presently from a great distance and faintly there came an answering scream, and a half hour later the lithe form of Sheeta bounded into view where the others of the pack were clambering gingerly into the canoe. The great beast, with arched back and purring like a contented tabby, rubbed his sides against the ape-man, and then at a word from the latter sprang lightly to its former place in the bow of the dugout. When all were in place it was discovered that two of the apes of a cut were missing, and though both the king ape and Tarzan called to them for the better part of an hour there was no response, and finally the boat put off without them. As it happened that the two missing ones were the very same who had evinced the least desire to accompany the expedition from the island, and had suffered the most from fright during the voyage, Tarzan was quite sure that they had absented themselves purposely rather than again enter the canoe. As the party were putting in for the shore shortly after noon to search for food, a slender, naked savage watched them for a moment from behind the dense screen of verdure which lined the river's bank. Then he melted away upstream before any of those in the canoe discovered him. Like a deer he bounded along the narrow trail until, filled with the excitement of his news, he burst into a native village several miles above the point at which Tarzan and his pack had stopped to hunt. "'Another white man is coming,' he cried to the chief who squatted before the entrance to a circular hut. "'Another white man, and with him are many warriors. They come in a great war canoe to kill and rob, as did the black-bearded one who has just left us.' Kaviri leaped to his feet. He had but recently had a taste of the white man's medicine, and his savage heart was filled with bitterness and hate. In another moment the rumble of the war-drums rose from the village, calling in the hunters from the forest and the tillers from the fields. Seven war canoes were launched and manned by paint-daubed, befeathered warriors. Long spears bristled from the rude battleships, as they slid noiselessly over the bosom of the water, propelled by giant muscles rolling beneath glistening ebony hides. There was no beating of tom-toms now, nor blare of native horn, for Kavari was a crafty warrior, and it was in his mind to take no chances if they could be avoided. He would swoop noiselessly down with his seven canoes upon the single one of the white man and before the guns of the latter could inflict much damage upon his people, he would have overwhelmed the enemy by force of numbers. Kaviri's own canoe went in advance of the others a short distance, and as it rounded a sharp bend in the river where the swift current bore it rapidly on its way, it came suddenly upon the thing that Kaviri sought. So close were the two canoes to one another that the black had only an opportunity to note the white face in the bow of the oncoming craft before the two touched and his own men were upon their feet yelling like mad devils, and thrusting their long spears at the occupants of the other canoe. But a moment later, when Kaviri was able to realize the nature of the crew that manned the white man's dugout, he would have given all the beads and iron wire that he possessed to have been safely within his distant village. Scarcely had the two craft come together than the frightful apes of a cut rose, growling and barking, from the bottom of the canoe, and, with long hairy arms far outstretched, grasped the menacing spears from the hands of Kaviri's warriors. The blacks were overcome with terror, but there was nothing to do other than fight. Now came the other war canoes rapidly down upon the two craft. Their occupants were eager to join the battle, for they thought that their foes were white men and their native porters. They swarmed about Tarzan's craft, but when they saw the nature of the enemy, all but one turned and paddled swiftly upriver. That one came too close to the ape-man's craft before its occupants realized that their fellows were pitted against demons instead of men. As it touched, Tarzan spoke a few low words to Sheeta and Akut, so that before the attacking warriors could draw away, there sprang upon them with a blood-freezing scream, a huge panther, and into the other end of their canoe clambered a great ape. At one end the panther wrought fearful havoc with his mighty talons and long sharp fangs, while Akut at the other buried his yellow canines in the necks of those that came within his reach, hurling the terror-stricken blacks overboard as he made his way toward the center of the canoe. Kaviri was so busily engaged with the demons that had entered his own craft that he could offer no assistance to his warriors in the other. A giant of a white devil had wrested a spear from him as though he, the mighty Kaviri, had been but a newborn babe. Hairy monsters were overcoming his fighting men, and a black chieftain like himself was fighting shoulder to shoulder with the hideous pack that opposed him. 
Kaviri battled bravely against his antagonist, for he felt that death had already claimed him, and so the least that he could do would be to sell his life as dearly as possible. But it was soon evident that his best was quite futile when pitted against the superhuman brawn and agility of the creature that at last found his throat and bent him back into the bottom of the canoe. Presently Kaviri's head began to whirl. Objects became confused and dim before his eyes. There was a great pain in his chest as he struggled for the breath of life that the thing upon him was shutting off forever. Then he lost consciousness. When he opened his eyes once more, he found, much to his surprise, that he was not dead. He lay, securely bound, in the bottom of his own canoe. A great panther sat upon its haunches, looking down upon him. Kaviri shuddered and closed his eyes again waiting for the ferocious creature to spring upon him and put him out of his misery of terror. After a moment, no rending fangs having buried themselves in his trembling body, he again ventured to open his eyes. Beyond the panther kneeled the white giant who had overcome him. The man was wielding a paddle, while directly behind him Kaviri saw some of his own warriors similarly engaged. Back of them again squatted several of the hairy apes. Tarzan, seeing that the chief had regained consciousness, addressed him. Your warriors tell me that you are chief of a numerous people, and that your name is Kaviri, he said. Yes, replied the black. Why did you attack me? I came in peace. Another white man came in peace three moons ago, replied Kaviri, and after we had brought him presents of a goat and cassava and milk, he set upon us with his guns and killed many of my people, and then went on his way, taking all of our goats and many of our young men and women. I am not as this other white man, replied Tarzan. I should not have harmed you had you not set upon me. Tell me, what was the face of this bad white man like? I am searching for one who has wronged me. Possibly this may be the very one. He was a man with a bad face covered with a great black beard, and he was very, very wicked. Yes, very wicked indeed. Was there a little white child with him? asked Tarzan. His heart almost stopped as he awaited the black's answer. No, Buana, replied Kaviri. The white child was not with this man's party. It was with the other party. "'Other party!' exclaimed Tarzan. "'What other party?' "'With the party that the very bad white man was pursuing. "'There was a white man, woman, and the child, with six Masula porters. "'They passed up the river three days ahead of the very bad white man. "'I think that they were running away from him.' "'A white man, woman, and child. Tarzan was puzzled. "'The child must be his little Jack. "'But who could the woman be? And the man? "'Was it possible that one of Rokoff's confederates had conspired with some woman, "'who had accompanied the Russian, to steal the baby from him?' If this was the case, they had doubtless purposed returning the child to civilization, and there either claiming a reward or holding the little prisoner for ransom. But now that Rokoff had succeeded in chasing them far inland, up the savage river, there could be little doubt but that he would eventually overhaul them, unless, as was still more probable, they should be captured and killed by the very cannibals farther up the Ungambi, whom Tarzan was now convinced it had been Rokoff's intention to deliver the baby. As he talked to Kaviri, the canoes had been moving steadily upriver toward the chief's village. Kaviri's warriors plied the paddles in the three canoes, casting sidelong terrified glances at their hideous passengers. Three of the apes of Akut had been killed in the encounter, but there were, with Akut, eight of the frightful beasts remaining, and there was Sheeta, the panther, and Tarzan, and Mugambi. Kaviri's warriors thought that they had never seen so terrible a crew in all their lives. Momentarily they expected to be pounced upon and torn asunder by some of their captors, and, in fact, it was all that Tarzan and Mugambi and Akut could do to keep the snarling, ill-natured brutes from snapping at the glistening, naked bodies that brushed against them now and then with the movements of the paddlers, whose very fear added incitement to the beast. At Kaviri's camp, Tarzan paused only long enough to eat the food that the blacks furnished, and to arrange with the chief for a dozen men to man the paddles of his canoe. Kaviri was only too glad to comply with any demands that the ape-man might make if only such compliance would hasten the departure of the horrid pack. But it was easier, he discovered, to promise men than to furnish them. For when his people learned his intentions, those that had not already fled into the jungle proceeded to do so without loss of time. So that when Kaviri turned to point out those who were to accompany Tarzan, he discovered that he was the only member of his tribe left in the village. Tarzan could not repress a smile. They do not seem anxious to accompany us, he said. But just remain quietly here, Kaviri, and presently you shall see your people flocking to your side. Then the ape-man rose, and, calling his pack about him, commanded that Mungambi remain with Kaviri, and disappeared in the jungle with Sheeta and the apes at his heels. For half an hour the silence of the grim forest was broken only by the ordinary sounds of the teeming life that but adds to its lowering loneliness. 
Kaviri and Mungambi sat alone in the palisaded village, waiting. Presently from a great distance came a hideous sound. Mungambi recognized the weird challenge of the ape-man. Immediately from different points of the compass rose a horrid semicircle of similar shrieks and screams, punctuated now and again by the blood-curdling cry of a hungry panther. End of Chapter 6 The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 7 Betrayed The two savages, Kaviri and Mungambi, squatting before the entrance to Kaviri's hut, looked at one another, Kaviri with ill-concealed alarm. "'What is it?' he whispered. "'It is Buana Tarzan and his people,' replied Mungambi. "'But what they are doing I know not, unless it be that they are devouring your people who ran away.' Kaviri shuddered and rolled his eyes fearfully toward the jungle. In all his long life in the savage forest he had never heard such an awful, fearsome din. Closer and closer came the sounds, and now with them were mingled the terrified shrieks of women and children and of men. For twenty long minutes the blood-curdling cries continued, until they seemed but a stone's throw from the palisade. Kaviri rose to flee, but Mungambi seized and held him, for such had been the command of Tarzan. A moment later, a horde of terrified natives burst from the jungle, racing toward the shelter of their huts. Like frightened sheep they ran, and behind them, driving them as sheep might be driven, came Tarzan and Sheeta and the hideous apes of a cut. Presently Tarzan stood before Kaviri, the old quiet smile upon his lips. "'Your people have returned, my brother,' he said. "'And now you may select those who are to accompany me and paddle my canoe.' Tremblingly, Kaviri tottered to his feet, calling to his people to come from their huts but none responded to his summons. "'Tell them,' suggested Tarzan, "'that if they do not come, I shall send my people in after them.' Kaviri did as he was bid, and in an instant the entire population of the village came forth, their wide and frightened eyes rolling from one to another of the savage creatures that wandered about the village street. Quickly Kaviri designated a dozen warriors to accompany Tarzan. The poor fellows went almost white with terror at the prospect of close contact with the panther and the apes in the narrow confines of the canoes. But when Kaviri explained to them that there was no escape, that Buana Tarzan would pursue them with his grim horde should they attempt to run away from the duty, they finally went gloomily down to the river and took their places in the canoe. It was with a sigh of relief that their chieftain saw the party disappear about a headland a short distance up river. For three days the strange company continued farther and farther into the heart of the savage country that lies on either side of the almost unexplored Ungambi. Three of the twelve warriors deserted during that time, but as several of the apes had finally learned the secret of the paddles, Tarzan felt no dismay because of the loss. As a matter of fact, he could have traveled much more rapidly on shore, but he believed that he could hold his own wild crew together to better advantage by keeping them to the boat as much as possible. Twice a day they landed to hunt and feed, and at night they slept upon the bank of the mainland or on one of the numerous little islands that dotted the river. Before them the natives fled in alarm, so that they found only deserted villages in their path as they proceeded. Tarzan was anxious to get in touch with some of the savages who dwelt upon the river's banks, but so far he had been unable to do so. Finally he decided to take to the land himself, leaving his company to follow after him by boat. He explained to Mungambi the thing that he had in mind, and told a cut to follow the directions of the black. I will join you again in a few days, he said. Now I go ahead to learn what has become of the very bad white man whom I seek. At the next halt Tarzan took to the shore, and was soon lost to the view of his people. The first few villages he came to were deserted, showing that news of the coming of his pack had traveled rapidly. But toward evening he came upon a distant clutter of thatched huts surrounded by a rude palisade, within which were a couple of hundred natives. The women were preparing the evening meal as Tarzan of the Apes poised above them in the branches of a giant tree which overhung the palisade at one point. The ape-man was at a loss as to how he might enter into communication with these people without either frightening them or arousing their savage love of battle. He had no desire to fight now, for he was upon a much more important mission than that of battling with every chance tribe that he should happen to meet with. At last he hit upon a plan, and after seeing that he was concealed from the view of those below, he gave a few hoarse grunts in imitation of a panther. All eyes immediately turned upward toward the foliage above. It was growing dark, and they could not penetrate the leafy screen which shielded the ape-man from their view. The moment that he had won their attention, he raised his voice to the shriller and more hideous scream of the beast he personated, and then, scarce stirring a leaf in his descent, dropped to the ground once again outside the palisade, 
and, with the speed of a deer, ran quickly round to the village gate. Here he beat upon the fiber-bound saplings of which the barrier was constructed, shouting to the natives in their own tongue that he was a friend who wished food and shelter for the night. Tarzan knew well the nature of the black man. He was aware that the grunting and screaming of Sheeta in the tree above them would set their nerves on edge, and that his pounding upon their gate after dark would still further add to their terror. That they did not reply to his hail was no surprise, for natives are fearful of any voice that comes out of the night from beyond their palisades, attributing it always to some demon or other ghostly visitor. But still he continued to call. "'Let me in, my friends,' he cried. "'I am a white man, pursuing the very bad white man who passed this way a few days ago. I follow to punish him for the sins he has committed against you and me. If you doubt my friendship, I will prove it to you by going into the tree above your village and driving Sheeta back into the jungle before he leaps among you. If you will not promise to take me in and treat me as a friend, I shall let Sheeta stay and devour you. For a moment there was silence. Then the voice of an old man came out of the quiet of the village street. If you are indeed a white man and a friend, we will let you come in, but first you must drive Sheeta away. Very well, replied Tarzan. Listen, and you shall hear Sheeta fleeing before me. The ape-man returned quickly to the tree, and this time he made a great noise as he entered the branches, at the same time growling ominously after the manner of the panther, so that those below would believe that the great beast was still there. When he reached a point well above the village street, he made a great commotion, shaking the tree violently, crying aloud to the panther to flee or be killed, and punctuating his own voice with the screams and mouthings of an angry beast. Presently he raced toward the opposite side of the tree and off into the jungle, pounding loudly against the boles of trees as he went, and voicing the panther's diminishing growls as he drew farther and farther away from the village. A few minutes later he returned to the village gate, calling to the natives within. "'I have driven Sheeta away,' he said. "'Now come and admit me as you promised.' For a time there was the sound of excited discussion within the palisade, but at length a half-dozen warriors came and opened the gates peering anxiously out in evident trepidation as to the nature of the creature which they should find waiting there. They were not much relieved at sight of an almost naked white man, but when Tarzan had reassured them in quiet tones, protesting his friendship for them, they opened the barrier a trifle farther and admitted him. When the gates had been once more secured, the self-confidence of the savages returned, and as Tarzan walked up the village street towards the chief's hut, he was surrounded by a host of curious men, women, and children. From the chief he learned that Rokoff had passed up the river a week previous, and that he had horns growing from his forehead, and was accompanied by a thousand devils. Later the chief said that the very bad white man had remained a month in his village. Though none of these statements agreed with Kaviri's, that the Russian was but three days gone from the chieftain's village, and that his following was much smaller than now stated, Tarzan was in no manner surprised at the discrepancies, for he was quite familiar with the savage mind's strange manner of functioning. What he was most interested in knowing was that he was upon the right trail, and that it led toward the interior. In this circumstance he knew that Rokoff could never escape him. After several hours of questioning and cross-questioning, the ape-man learned that another party had preceded the Russian by several days, three whites, a man, a woman, and a little man-child, with several masulas. Tarzan explained to the chief that his people would follow him in a canoe, probably the next day, and that though he might go on ahead of them, the chief was to receive them kindly, and have no fear of them, for Mugambi would see that they did not harm the chief's people if they were accorded a friendly reception. And now, he concluded, I shall lie down beneath this tree and sleep. I am very tired. Permit no one to disturb me. The chief offered him a hut, but Tarzan, from past experience of native dwellings, preferred the open air, and further, he had plans of his own that could be better carried out if he remained beneath the tree. He gave, as his reason, a desire to be close at hand should Sheeta return, and after this explanation the chief was very glad to permit him to sleep beneath the tree. Tarzan had always found that it stood him in good stead to leave with natives the impression that he was to some extent possessed of more or less miraculous powers. He might easily have entered their village without recourse to the gates, but he believed that a sudden and unaccountable disappearance when he was ready to leave them would result in a more lasting impression upon their childlike minds. And so, as soon as the village was quiet in sleep, he rose and, leaping to the branches of the tree above him, faded silently into the black mystery of the jungle night. All the balance of that night, the ape-man swung rapidly through the upper and middle terraces of the forest. When the going was good there, he preferred the upper branches of the giant trees, for then his way was better lighted by the moon. But so accustomed were all his senses to the grim world of his birth that it was possible for him, 
even in the dense black shadows near the ground, to move with ease and rapidity. You or I, walking beneath the arcs of Main Street or Broadway or State Street, could not have moved more surely or with a tenth the speed of the agile ape-man through the gloomy mazes that would have baffled us entirely. At dawn he stopped to feed, and then he slept for several hours, taking up the pursuit again toward noon. Twice he came upon natives, and though he had considerable difficulty in approaching them, he succeeded in each instance in quieting both their fears and bellicose intentions toward him, and learned from them that he was upon the trail of the Russian. Two days later, still following up the Ungambi, he came upon a large village. The chief, a wicked-looking fellow with the sharp filed teeth that often denote the cannibal, received him with apparent friendliness. The ape-man was now thoroughly fatigued, and had determined to rest for eight or ten hours that he might be fresh and strong when he caught up with Rokoff, as he was sure he must do within a very short time. The chief told him that the bearded white man had left his village only the morning before, and that doubtless he would be able to overtake him in a short time. The other party the chief had not seen or heard of, so he said. Tarzan did not like the appearance or manner of the fellow, who seemed, though friendly enough, to harbor a certain contempt for this half-naked white man who came with no followers and offered no presents. But he needed the rest and food that the village would afford him with less effort than the jungle, and so, as he knew no fear of man, beast, or devil, he curled himself up in the shadow of a hut and was soon asleep. Scarcely had he left the chief than the latter called two of his warriors, to whom he whispered a few instructions. A moment later, the sleek black bodies were racing along the river path, upstream toward the east. In the village, the chief maintained perfect quiet. He would permit no one to approach the sleeping visitor, nor any singing, nor loud talking. He was remarkably solicitous lest his guest be disturbed. Three hours later, several canoes came silently into view from up the Ungambi. They were being pushed ahead rapidly by the brawny muscles of their black crews. Upon the bank before the river stood the chief, his spear raised in a horizontal position above his head, as though in some manner of predetermined signal to those within the boats. And such indeed was the purpose of his attitude, which meant that the white stranger within his village still slept peacefully. In the bows of the two canoes were the runners that the chief had sent forth three hours earlier. It was evident that they had been dispatched to follow and bring back this party, and that the signal from the bank was one that had been determined upon before they left the village. In a few moments the dugouts drew up to the verdure clad bank. The native warriors filed out, and with them a half-dozen white men. Sullen, ugly-looking customers they were, and none more so than the evil-faced, black-bearded man who commanded them. "'Where is the white man your messengers report to be with you?' he asked the chief. "'This way, Buana," replied the native. "'Carefully have I kept silence in the village that he might be still asleep when you returned. I do not know that he is one who seeks you to do harm, but he questioned me closely about your coming and your going, and his appearance is as that of the one you described, but whom you believe safe in the country which you called Jungle Island. Had you not told me this tale, I should not have recognized him, and then he might have gone after and slain you. If he is a friend and no enemy, then no harm has been done, Buana. But if he proves to be an enemy, I should like very much to have a rifle and some ammunition. You have done well, replied the white man and you shall have the rifle and ammunition whether he be a friend or enemy, provided that you stand with me. I shall stand with you, Buana, said the chief, and now come and look upon the stranger who sleeps within my village. So saying, he turned and led the way toward the hut in the shadow of which the unconscious Tarzan slept peacefully. Behind the two men came the remaining whites and a score of warriors, but the raised forefingers of the chief and his companion held them all to perfect silence. As they turned the corner of the hut, cautiously and upon tiptoe, an ugly smile touched the lips of the white as his eyes fell upon the giant figure of the sleeping ape-man. The chief looked at the other inquiringly. The latter nodded his head to signify that the chief had made no mistake in his suspicions. Then he turned to those behind him, and, pointing to the sleeping man, motioned for them to seize and bind him. A moment later a dozen brutes had leaped upon the surprised Tarzan, and so quickly did they work that he was securely bound before he could make half an effort to escape. Then they threw him down upon his back, and as his eyes turned toward the crowd that stood near, they fell upon the malign face of Nicholas Rokoff. A sneer curled the Russian's lips. He stepped quite close to Tarzan. Pig, he cried, have you not learned sufficient wisdom to keep away from Nicholas Rokoff? Then he kicked the prostrate man full in the face. That for your welcome, he said. Tonight, before my Ethiop friends eat you, 
I shall tell you what has already befallen your wife and child, and what further plans I have for their futures. End of Chapter 7「The Beast of Tarzan » by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 8 – The Dance of Death Through the luxuriant tangled vegetation of the Stingian jungle night a great lithe body made its way sinuously and in utter silence upon its soft padded feet. Only two blazing points of yellow-green flame shone occasionally with the reflected light of the equatorial moon that now and again pierced the softly sighing roof rustling in the night wind. Occasionally the beast would stop with high-held nose, sniffing searchingly. At other times a quick, brief incursion into the branches above delayed it momentarily in its steady journey toward the east. To its sensitive nostrils came the subtle, unseen spore of many a tender four-footed creature, bringing the slaver of hunger to the cruel, drooping jowl. But steadfastly it kept on its way, strangely ignoring the cravings of appetite that at another time would have sent the rolling, fur-clad muscles flying at some soft throat. All that night the creature pursued its lonely way, and the next day it halted only to make a single kill, which it tore to fragments and devoured with sullen, grumbling rumbles as though half famished for lack of food. It was dusk when it approached the palisade that surrounded a large native village. Like the shadow of a swift and silent death, it circled the village, nose to ground, halting at last close to the palisade, where it almost touched the backs of several huts. Here the beast sniffed for a moment, and then, turning its head upon one side, listened with up-pricked ears. What it heard was no sound by the standards of human ears, yet to the highly attuned and delicate organs of the beast a message seemed to be borne to the savage brain. A wondrous transformation was wrought in the motionless mass of statuesque bone and muscle that had an instant before stood as though carved out of the living bronze. As if it had been poised upon steel springs, suddenly released, it rose quickly and silently to the top of the palisade, disappearing stealthily and cat-like into the dark space between the wall and the back of an adjacent hut. In the village street beyond, women were preparing many little fires and fetching cooking pots filled with water, for a great feast was to be celebrated ere the night was many hours older. About a stout stake near the center of the circling fires, a little knot of black warriors stood conversing, their bodies smeared with white and blue and ochre in broad and grotesque bands. Great circles of color were drawn about their eyes and lips, their breasts and abdomens, and from their clay plastered coffers rose gay feathers and bits of long straight wire. The village was preparing for a feast, while in a hut at one side of the scene of the coming orgy, the bound victim of their bestial appetites lay waiting for the end. And such an end! Tarzan of the apes, tensing his mighty muscles, strained at the bonds that pinioned him. But they had been reinforced many times at the instigation of the Russian, so that not even the ape-man's giant brawn could bulge them. Death! Tarzan had looked the hideous hunter in the face many a time and smiled. And he would smile again tonight when he knew the end was coming quickly. But now his thoughts were not of himself, but of those others, the dear ones who must suffer most because of his passing. Jane would never know the manner of it. For that he thanked heaven, and he was thankful also that she at least was safe in the heart of the world's greatest city, safe among kind and loving friends who would do their best to lighten her misery. But the boy! Tarzan writhed at the thought of him, his son, and now he, the mighty lord of the jungle, he, Tarzan, king of the apes, the only one in all the world fitted to find and save the child from the horrors that Rokoff's evil mind had planned, had been trapped like a silly, dumb creature. He was to die in a few hours, and with him would go the child's last chance of succor. Rokoff had been in to see and revile and abuse him several times during the afternoon, but he had been able to wring no word of remonstrance or murmur of pain from the lips of the giant captive. So at last he had given up, reserving his particular bit of exquisite mental torture for the last moment, when, just before the savage spears of the cannibals should forever make the object of his hated immune to further suffering, the Russian planned to reveal to his enemy the true whereabouts of his wife whom he thought safe in England. Dusk had fallen upon the village, and the ape-man could hear the preparations going forward for the torture and the feast. The dance of death he could picture in his mind's eye, for he had seen the thing many times in the past. Now he was to be the central figure, bound to the stake. The torture of the slow death as the circling warriors cut him to bits with the fiendish skill that mutilated without bringing unconsciousness had no terrors for him. He was inured to suffering and to the sight of blood and to cruel death, but the desire to live was no less strong within him, and until the last spark of life should flicker and go out, his whole being would remain quick with hope and determination. 
Let them relax their watchfulness but for an instant. He knew that his cunning mind and giant muscles would find a way to escape. Escape and revenge. As he lay, thinking furiously on every possibility of self-salvation, there came to his sensitive nostrils a faint and familiar scent. Instantly every faculty of his mind was upon the alert. Presently his trained ears caught the sound of the soundless presence without, behind the hut wherein he lay. His lips moved, and though no sound came forth that might have been appreciable to a human ear beyond the walls of his prison, yet he realized that the one beyond would hear. Already he knew who that one was, for his nostrils had told him as plainly as your eyes or mine tell us of the identity of an old friend whom we come upon in broad daylight. An instant later he heard the soft sound of a fur-clad body and padded feet scaling the outer wall behind the hut, and then a tearing at the poles which formed the wall. Presently through the hole thus made slunk a great beast, pressing its cold muzzle close to his neck. It was Sheeta, the panther. The beast snuffed round the prostrate man, whining a little. There was a limit to the interchange of ideas which could take place between these two, and so Tarzan could not be sure that Sheeta understood all that he attempted to communicate to him. That the man was tied and helpless Sheeta could, of course, see, but that to the mind of the panther this would carry any suggestion of harm in so far as his master was concerned, Tarzan could not guess. What had brought the beast to him? The fact that he had come augured well for what he might accomplish. But when Tarzan tried to get Sheeta to gnaw his bonds asunder, the great animal could not seem to understand what was expected of him, and instead but licked the wrist and arms of the prisoner. Presently there came an interruption. Someone was approaching the hut. Sheeta gave a low growl and slunk into the blackness of a far corner. Evidently the visitor did not hear the warning sound, for almost immediately he entered the hut, a tall, naked, savage warrior. He came to Tarzan's side and pricked him with a spear. From the lips of the ape-man came a weird, uncanny sound, and in answer to it there leaped from the blackness of the hut's farthermost corner a bolt of fur-clad death. Full upon the breast of the painted savage the great beast struck, burying sharp talons in the black flesh, and sinking great yellow fangs in the ebon throat. There was a fearful scream of anguish and terror from the black, and mingled with it was the hideous challenge of the killing panther. Then came silence, silence except for the rending of bloody flesh and the crunching of human bones between mighty jaws. The noise had brought sudden quiet to the village without. Then there came the sound of voices in consultation, high-pitched, fear-filled voices, and deep, low tones of authority as the chief spoke. Tarzan and the panther heard the approaching footsteps of many men, and then, to Tarzan's surprise, the great cat rose from across the body of its kill, and slunk noiselessly from the hut through the aperture through which it had entered. The man heard the soft scraping of the body as it passed over the top of the palisade, and then silence. From the opposite side of the hut he heard the savages approaching to investigate. He had little hope that Sheeta would return. For had the great cat intended to defend him against all comers, it would have remained by his side as it heard the approaching savages without. Tarzan knew how strange were the workings of the brains of the mighty carnivora of the jungle, how fiendishly fearless they might be in the face of certain death, and again how timid upon the slightest provocation. There was doubt in his mind that some note of the approaching blats vibrating with fear had struck an answering chord in the nervous system of the panther, sending him slinking through the jungle, his tail between his legs. The man shrugged. Well, what of it? He had expected to die, and, after all, what might Sheeta have done for him other than to maul a couple of his enemies before a rifle in the hands of one of the whites should have dispatched him? If the cat could have released him, ah, that would have resulted in a very different story. But it had proved beyond the understanding of Sheeta, and now the beast was gone, and Tarzan must definitely abandon hope. The natives were at the entrance to the hut now, peering fearfully into the dark interior. Two in advance held lighted torches in their left hands, and ready spears in their right. They held back timorously against those behind, who were pushing them forward. The shrieks of the panther's victim, mingled with those of the great cat, had wrought mightily upon their poor nerves. And now the awful silence of the dark interior seemed even more terribly ominous than had the frightful screaming. Presently one of those who was being forced unwillingly within hit upon a happy scheme for learning first the precise nature of the danger which menaced him from the silent interior. With a quick movement he flung his lighted torch into the center of the hut. Instantly all was illuminated for a brief second before the burning brand was dashed out against the earth floor. There was the figure of the white prisoner, still securely bound as they had last seen him, and in the center of the hut another figure equally as motionless, its throat and breast horribly torn and mangled. 
The sight that met the eyes of the foremost savages inspired more terror within their superstitious breasts than would the presence of Sheeta, for they saw only the result of a ferocious attack upon one of their fellows. Not seeing the cause, their fear-ridden minds were free to attribute the ghastly work to supernatural causes, and with the thought they turned, screaming from the hut, bowling over those who stood directly behind them in the exuberance of their terror. For an hour Tarzan heard only the murmur of excited voices from the far end of the village. Evidently the savages were once more attempting to work up their flickering courage to a point that would permit them to make another invasion of the hut, for now and then came a savage yell, such as the warriors give to bolster up their bravery upon the field of battle. But in the end it was two of the whites who first entered, carrying torches and guns. Tarzan was not surprised to discover that neither of them was Rokoff. He would have wagered his soul that no power on earth could have tempted that great coward to face the unknown menace of the hut. When the natives saw that the white men were not attacked, they too crowded into the interior. Their voices hushed with terror as they looked upon the mutilated corpse of their comrade. The whites tried in vain to elicit an explanation from Tarzan, but to all their queries he but shook his head, a grim and knowing smile curving his lips. At last Rokoff came. His face grew very white as his eyes rested upon the bloody thing grinning up at him from the floor, the face set in a death mass of excruciating horror. Come, he said to the chief. Let us get to work and finish this demon before he has an opportunity to repeat this thing upon more of your people. The chief gave orders that Tarzan should be lifted and carried to the stake, but it was several minutes before he could prevail upon any of his men to touch the prisoner. At last, however, four of the younger warriors dragged Tarzan roughly from the hut, and once outside the pall of terror seemed lifted from the savage hearts. A score of howling blacks pushed and buffeted the prisoner down the village street, and bound him to the post in the center of the circle of little fires and boiling cooking pots. When at last he was made fast and seemed quite helpless and beyond the faintest hope of succor, Rokoff's shriveled ward of courage swelled to its usual proportions when danger was not present. He stepped close to the ape-man, and, seizing a spear from the hands of one of the savages, was the first to prod the helpless victim. A little stream of blood trickled down the giant's smooth skin from the wound in his side, but no murmur of pain passed his lips. The smile of contempt upon his face seemed to infuriate the Russian. With a volley of oaths, he leaped at the helpless captive, beating him upon the face with his clenched fists and kicking him mercilessly about the legs. Then he raised the heavy spear to drive it through the mighty heart, and still Tarzan of the Apes smiled contemptuously upon him. Before Rokoff could drive the weapon home, the chief sprang upon him and dragged him away from his attended victim. "'Stop, white man,' he cried. "'Rob us of this prisoner.' and our death dance, and you yourself may have to take his place. The threat proved most effective in keeping the Russian from further assaults upon the prisoner, though he continued to stand a little apart and hurl taunts at his enemy. He told Tarzan that he himself was going to eat the ape-man's heart. He enlarged upon the horrors of the future life of Tarzan's son, and intimated that his vengeance would reach as well to Jane Clayton. "'You think your wife's safe in England,' said Rokoff. "'Poor fool!' She is even now in the hands of one not even of decent birth, and far from the safety of London and the protection of her friends. I had not meant to tell you this until I could bring to you upon Jungle Island proof of her fate. Now that you are about to die the most unthinkably horrible death that it has given a white man to die, let this word of the plight of your wife add to the torments that you must suffer before the last savage spear thrust releases you from your torture. The dance had commenced now, and the yells of the circling warriors drowned Rokoff's further attempts to distress his victim. The leaping savages, the flickering firelight played upon their painted bodies, circled about the victim at the stake. To Tarzan's memory came a similar scene, when he had rescued Darnot from a like predicament at the last moment before the final spear thrust should have ended his suffering. Who was there now to rescue him? In all the world there was none able to save him from the torture and the death. The thought that these human fiends would devour him when the dance was done caused him not a single qualm of horror or disgust. It did not add to his sufferings as it would have to those of an ordinary white man, for all his life Tarzan had seen the beasts of the jungle devour the flesh of their kills. Had he himself not battled for the grisly forearm of a great ape at that long-gone dum-dum, when he had slain the fierce tublet and won his niche in the respect of the apes of Kerchak? The dancers were leaping more closely to him now, the spears were commencing to find his body in the first torturing pricks that prefaced the more serious thrust. It would not be long now. The ape man longed for the last savage lunge that would end his misery. And then, far out in the mazes of the weird jungle, rose a shrill scream. 
For an instant the dancers paused, and in the silence of the interval there rose from the lips of the fast-bound white man an answering shriek, more fearsome and more terrible than that of the jungle beast that had roused it. For several minutes the blacks hesitated. Then, at the urging of Rokoff and their chief, they leaped in to finish the dance and the victim, but ere ever another spear touched the brown hide, a tawny streak of green-eyed hate and ferocity bounded from the door of the hut in which Tarzan had been imprisoned, and Sheeta, the panther, stood snarling beside his master. For an instant the blacks and the whites stood transfixed with terror. Their eyes were riveted upon the bared fangs of the jungle cat. Only Tarzan of the apes saw what else there was emerging from the dark interior of the hut. End of Chapter 8 The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 9 Chivalry or Villainy From her cabin port upon the Kincaid, Jane Clayton had seen her husband row to the verdure-clad shore of Jungle Island, and then the ship once more proceeded upon its way. For several days she saw no one other than Sven Anderson, the Kincaid's taciturn and repellent cook. She asked them the name of the shore upon which her husband had been set. I think it blow pretty soon pretty hard, replied the Swede, and that was all that she could get out of him. She had come to the conclusion that he spoke no other English, and so she ceased to importune him for information. But never did she forget to greet him pleasantly, or to thank him for the hideous, nauseating meals he brought her. Three days from the spot where Tarzan had been marooned, the Kincaid came to anchor in the mouth of a great river, and presently Rokoff came to Jane Clayton's cabin. We have arrived, my dear, he said with a sickening leer. I have come to offer you safety, liberty, and ease. My heart has been softened towards you in your suffering, and I would make amends as best I may. Your husband was a brute, you know that best who found him naked in his native jungle, roaming wild with the savage beasts that were his fellows. Now I am a gentleman, not only born of noble blood, but raised gently as befits a man of quality. To you, dear Jane, I offer the love of a cultured man, an association with one of culture and refinement, which you must have sorely missed in your relations with the poor ape that through your girlish infatuation you married so thoughtlessly. I love you, Jane. You have but to say the word, and no further sorrow shall afflict you. Even your baby shall be returned to you unharmed. Outside the door Sven Anderson paused with the noonday meal he had been carrying to Lady Greystoke. Upon the end of his long stringy neck his little head was cocked to one side. His close-set eyes were half-closed. His ears, so expressive was his old attitude of stealthy eavesdropping, seemed truly to be cocked forward. Even his long, yellow, straggly mustache appeared to assume a sly droop. As Rokoff closed his appeal, awaiting the reply he invited, the look of surprise upon Jane Clayton's face turned to one of disgust. She fairly shuddered in the fellow's face. "'I would not have been surprised, M. Rokoff,' she said, "'had you attempted to force me to submit to your evil desires.' but that you should be so fatuous as to believe that I, wife of John Clayton, would come to you willingly, even to save my life, I should never have imagined. I have known you for a scoundrel, M. Rokoff, but until now I had not taken you for a fool. Rokoff's eyes narrowed, and the red of mortification flushed out the pallor of his face. He took a step toward the girl, threateningly. We shall see who is the fool at last, he hissed. When I have broken you to my will, and your plebeian Yankee stubbornness has cost you all that you hold dear, even the life of your baby, for, by the bones of St. Peter, I'll forego all that I had planned for the brat and cut its heart out before your very eyes. You'll learn what it means to insult Nicholas Rokoff. Jane Clayton turned wearily away. What is the use, she said, of expatiating upon the depths to which your vengeful nature can sink? You cannot move me either by threats or deeds. My baby cannot judge yet for himself, but I, his mother, can foresee that should it have been given him to survive to man's estate, he would willingly sacrifice his life for the honor of his mother. Love him as I do, I would not purchase his life at such a price. Did I, he would execrate my memory to the day of his death. Rokoff was now thoroughly angered because of his failure to reduce the girl to terror. He felt only hate for her, but it had come to his diseased mind that if he could force her to accede to his demands— as the price of her life and her child's, the cup of his revenge would be filled to brimming when he could flaunt the wife of Lord Greystoke in the capitals of Europe as his mistress. Again he stepped closer to her. His evil face was convulsed with rage and desire. Like a wild beast he sprang upon her, and with his strong fingers at her throat forced her backward upon the berth. At the same instant the door of the cabin opened noisily. Rokoff leaped to his feet 
and turning, faced the Swede cook. Into the fellow's usually foxy eyes had come an expression of utter stupidity. His lower jaw dropped in vacuous harmony. He busied himself in arranging Lady Greystoke's meal upon the tiny table at one side of her cabin. The Russian glared at him. "'What do you mean?' he cried. "'By entering here without permission. Get out!' The cook turned his watery blue eyes upon Rokoff and smiled vacuously. "'I think it blow pretty soon pretty hard,' he said, and then he began rearranging the few dishes upon the little table. "'Get out of here, or I'll throw you out, you miserable blockhead,' roared Rokoff, taking a threatening step toward the Swede. Anderson continued to smile foolishly in his direction, but one ham-like paw slid stealthily to the handle of the long, slim knife that protruded from the greasy cord supporting his soiled apron. Rokoff saw the move and stopped short in his advance. Then he turned towards Jane Clayton. "'I will give you until tomorrow,' he said, "'to reconsider your answer to my offer. All will be sent ashore upon one pretext or another except you and the child, Paulvich and myself.' Then, without interruption, you will be able to witness the death of the baby. He spoke in French that the cook might not understand the sinister portent of his words. When he had done, he banged out of the cabin without another look at the man who had interrupted him in his sorry work. When he had gone, Sven Anderson turned toward Lady Greystoke. The idiotic expression that had masked his thoughts had fallen away, and in its place was one of craft and cunning. Hey, tank, I been a fool, he said. Hey, been the fool. I savvy French. Jane Clayton looked at him in surprise. "'You understand all that he said, then?' Anderson grinned. "'You bet,' he said. "'And you heard what was going on in here and came to protect me?' "'You bang good to me,' explained the Swede. "'Hey, treat me like dirty dog. "'I help you, lady. "'You yes vate. "'I help you. "'I been vas coast lots times.' "'But how can you help me, Sven?' she asked, "'when all these men will be against us.' I tank, said Sven Anderson. It blow pretty soon pretty hard. And then he turned and left the cabin. Though Jane Clayton doubted the cook's ability to be of any material service to her, she was nevertheless deeply grateful to him for what he had already done. The feeling that among these enemies she had one friend brought the first ray of comfort that had come to lighten the burden of her miserable apprehensions throughout the long voyage of the Kincaid. She saw no more of Rokoff that day, nor of any other until Sven came with her evening meal. She tried to draw him in the conversation relative to his plans to aid her, but all she could get from him was his stereotyped prophecy as to the future state of the wind. He seemed suddenly to have relapsed into his wanted state of dense stupidity. However, when he was leaving the cabin a little later with the empty dishes, he whispered very low, Leave on your clothes and roll up your blankets. I come back after you pretty soon. He would have slipped from the room at once, but Jane laid her hand upon his sleeve. My baby, she asked, I cannot go without him. You do what I tell you, said Anderson, scowling. I've been helping you, so don't you get too funny. When he had gone, Jane Clayton sank down upon her berth in utter bewilderment. What was she to do? Suspicions as to the intentions of the Swede swarmed her brain. Might she not be infinitely worse off if she gave herself into his power than she already was? No, she could be no worse off in company with the devil himself than with Nicholas Rokoff. For the devil, at least, bore the reputation of being a gentleman. She swore a dozen times that she would not leave the Kincaid without her baby, and yet she remained clothed long past her usual hour for retiring, and her blankets were neatly rolled and bound with stout cord, when, about midnight, there came a stealthy scratching upon the panels of her door. Swiftly she crossed the room and drew the bolt. Softly the door swung open to admit the muffled figure of the Swede. On one arm he carried a bundle, evidently his blankets. His other hand was raised in a gesture commanding silence, a grimy forefinger upon his lips. He came quite close to her. Carry this, he said. Do not make some noise when you see it, it being your kid. Quick hand snatched the bundle from the cook, and hungry mother arms folded the sleeping infant to her breast, while hot tears of joy ran down her cheeks, and her whole frame shook with the emotion of the moment. Come, said Anderson. We got no time to waste. He snatched up her bundle of blankets, and outside the cabin door his own as well. Then he led her to the ship's side, steadied her descent of the monkey ladder, holding the child for her as she climbed into the waiting boat below. A moment later, he had cut the rope that held the small boat to the steamer's side, and, bending silently to the muffled oars, was pulling toward the black shadows up the Ungambi River. Anderson rowed on as though quite sure of his ground, and when after half an hour the moon broke through the clouds, there was revealed upon their left the mouth of a tributary running into the Ungambi. Up this narrow channel the Swede turned the prow of the small boat. 
Jane Clayton wondered if the man knew where he was bound. She did not know that in his capacity as cook he had that day been rowed up this very stream to a little village where he had bartered with the natives for such provisions as they had for sale, and that he had there arranged the details of his plan for the adventure upon which they were now setting forth. Even though the moon was full, the surface of the small river was quite dark. The giant trees overhung its narrow banks, meeting in a great arch above the center of the river. Spanish moss dropped from the gracefully bending limbs, and enormous creepers clambered in riotous profusion from the ground to the loftiest branch, falling in curving loops almost to the water's placid breast. Now and then the river's surface would be suddenly broken ahead of them by a huge crocodile, startled by the splashing of the oars. Or, snorting and blowing, a family of hippos would dive from a sandy bar to the cool, safe depths of the bottom. From the dense jungles upon either side came the weird night cries of the carnivora, the maniacal voice of the hyena, the coughing grunt of the panther, the deep and awful roar of the lion, and with them strange, uncanny notes that the girl could not ascribe to any particular night prowler, more terrible because of their mystery. Huddled in the stern of the boat, she sat with her baby strained close to her bosom, and because of that little, tender, helpless thing, she was happier tonight than she had been for many a sorrow-ridden day. Even though she knew not to what fate she was going, or how soon that fate might overtake her, still she was happy and thankful for the moment, however brief, that she might press her baby tightly in her arms. She could scarce wait for the coming of the day, that she might look again upon the bright face of her little black-eyed Jack. Again and again she tried to strain her eyes through the blackness of the jungle night to have but a tiny peep at those beloved features. But only the dim outline of the baby face rewarded her efforts. Then once more she would cuddle the warm little bundle close to her throbbing heart. It must have been close to three o'clock in the morning that Anderson brought the boat's nose to shore before a clearing where it could be dimly seen in the waning moonlight a cluster of native huts encircled by a thorn boma. At the village gate they were admitted by a native woman, the wife of the chief whom Anderson had paid to assist him. She took them to the chief's hut, but Anderson said that they would sleep without upon the ground, and so, her duty having been completed, she left them to their own devices. The Swede, after explaining in his gruff way that the huts were doubtless filthy and vermin-ridden, spread Jane's blankets on the ground for her, and at a little distance unrolled his own and lay down to sleep. It was some time before the girl could find a comfortable position upon the hard ground, but at last, the baby in the hollow of her arm, she dropped asleep from utter exhaustion. When she awoke it was broad daylight. About her were clustered a score of curious natives, mostly men. For among the aborigines it is the male who owns this characteristic in its most exaggerated form. Instinctively, Jane Clayton drew the baby more closely to her, though she soon saw that the blacks were far from intending her or the child any harm. In fact, one of them offered her a gourd of milk, a filthy, smoke-begrimed gourd with the ancient rind of long curdled milk caked in layers within its neck. But the spirit of the giver touched her deeply, and her face lighted for a moment with one of those almost forgotten smiles of radiance that had helped to make her beauty famous both in Baltimore and London. She took the gourd in one hand, and rather than cause the giver pain, raised it to her lips, though for the life of her she could scarce restrain the qualm of nausea that surged through her as the malodorous thing approached her nostrils. It was Anderson who came to her rescue, and, taking the gourd from her, drank a portion himself, and then returned it to the native with a gift of blue beads. The sun was shining brightly now, and though the baby still slept, Jane could scarce restrain her impatient desire to have at least a brief glance at the beloved face. The natives had withdrawn at a command from their chief, who now stood talking with Anderson, a little apart from her. As she debated the wisdom of risking disturbing the child's slumber by lifting the blanket that now protected its face from the sun, she noted that the cook conversed with the chief in the language of the negro. What a remarkable man the fellow was indeed! She had thought him ignorant and stupid but a short day before, and now, within the past twenty-four hours, she had learned that he spoke not only English but French as well, and the primitive dialect of the West Coast. She had thought him shifty, cruel, and untrustworthy, yet in so far as she had reason to believe, he had proved himself in every way the contrary since the day before. It scarce seemed credible that he could be serving her from motives purely chivalrous. There must be something deeper in his intentions and plans than he had yet disclosed. She wondered, and when she looked at him, at his close-set, shifty eyes and repulsive features, she shuddered, for she was convinced that no lofty characteristics could be hid behind so foul an exterior. As she was thinking of these things, the while she debated the wisdom of uncovering the baby's face, 
There came a little grunt from the wee bundle in her lap, and then a gurgling coo that set her heart in raptures. The baby was awake. Now she might feast her eyes upon him. Quickly she snatched the blanket from before the infant's face. Anderson was looking at her as she did so. He saw her stagger to her feet, holding the baby at arm's length from her, her eyes glued in horror upon the little chubby face and twinkling eyes. Then he heard her piteous cry as her knees gave beneath her, and she sank to the ground in a swoon. End of chapter 9「Beast of Tarzan」by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 10 The Swede As the warriors clustered thick about Tarzan and Sheeta realized that it was a flesh-and-blood panther that had interrupted their dance of death, they took heart a trifle, for in the face of all those circling spears even the mighty Sheeta would be doomed. Rokoff was urging the chief to have his spearmen launch their missiles, and the black was upon the instant of issuing the command when his eyes strayed beyond Tarzan following the gaze of the ape-man. With a yell of terror, the chief turned and fled towards the village gate, and as his people looked to see the cause of his fright, they too took to their heels, for there, lumbering down upon them, their huge forms exaggerated by the play of moonlight and campfire, came the hideous apes of a cut. The instant the natives turned to flee, the ape-man's savage cry rang out above the shrieks of the blacks, and in answer to it, Sheeta and the apes leaped growling after the fugitives. Some of the warriors turned to battle with their enraged antagonists, but before the fiendish ferocity of the fierce beast they went down to bloody death. Others were dragged down in their flight, and it was not until the village was empty and the last of the blacks had disappeared into the bush that Tarzan was able to recall his savage pack to his side. Then it was that he discovered to his chagrin that he could not make one of them, not even the comparatively intelligent Akut, understand that he wished to be freed from the bonds that held him to the stake. In time, of course, the idea would filter through their thick skulls, but in the meanwhile many things might happen. The blacks might return in force to regain their village. The whites might readily pick them all off with their rifles from the surrounding trees. He might even starve to death before the dull-witted apes realized that he wished them to gnaw through his bonds. As for Sheeta, the great cat understood even less than the apes, but yet Tarzan could not but marvel at the remarkable characteristics this beast had evidenced. That it felt real affection for him there seemed little doubt, for now that the blacks were disposed of, it walked slowly back and forth about the stake, rubbing its sides against the ape-man's legs, and purring like a contented tabby. That it had gone of its own volition to bring the balance of the pack to his rescue, Tarzan could not doubt. His Sheeta was indeed a jewel among beasts. Mungambi's absence worried the ape-man not a little. He attempted to learn from a cut what had become of the black. Fearing that the beast, freed from the restraint of Tarzan's present, might have fallen upon the man and devoured him, but to all his questions the great ape but pointed back in the direction from which they had come out of the jungle. The night passed with Tarzan still fast bound to the stake, and shortly after dawn his fears were realized in the discovery of naked black figures moving stealthily just within the edge of the jungle about the village. The blacks were returning. With daylight their courage would be equal to the demands of a charge upon the handful of bees that had routed them from their rightful abodes. The result of the encounter seemed foregone if the savages could curb their superstitious terror for against their overwhelming numbers, their long spears and poisoned arrows, the panther and the apes could not be expected to survive a really determined attack. That the blacks were preparing for a charge became apparent a few moments later, when they commenced to show themselves in force upon the edge of the clearing, dancing and jumping about as they waved their spears and shouted taunts and fierce war cries toward the village. These maneuvers, Tarzan knew, would continue until the blacks had worked themselves into a state of hysterical courage sufficient to sustain them for a short charge toward the village and even though he doubted that they would reach it at first attempt, he believed that at the second or the third they would swarm through the gateway, when the outcome could not be aught than the extermination of Tarzan's bold but unarmed and undisciplined defenders. Even as he had guessed, the first charge carried the howling warriors but a short distance into the open, a shrill, weird challenge from the ape-man being all that was necessary to send them scurrying back to the bush. For half an hour they pranced and yelled their courage to the sticking point, and again essayed a charge. This time they came quite to the village gate, but when Sheeta and the hideous apes leaped among them, they turned screaming in terror, and again fled into the jungle. Again was the dancing and shouting repeated. This time Tarzan felt no doubt that they would enter the village and complete the work that a handful of determined white men would have carried to a successful conclusion at the first attempt. To have rescue come so close, only to be thwarted because he could not make his poor, savage friends understand precisely what he wanted of them was most irritating. 
but he could not find it in his heart to place blame upon them. They had done their best, and now he was sure they would doubtless remain to die with him in a fruitless effort to defend him. The blacks were already preparing for the charge. A few individuals had advanced a short distance toward the village, and were exhorting the others to follow them. In a moment the whole savage horde would be racing across the clearing. Tarzan thought only of the little child somewhere in this cruel, relentless wilderness. His heart ached for the son that he might no longer seek to save, and that the realization of Jane's suffering were all that weighed upon his brave spirit in these that he thought his last moments of life. Succor, all that he could hope for, had come to him in the instant of his extremity, and failed. There was nothing further for which to hope. The blacks were halfway across the clearing when Tarzan's attention was attracted by the actions of one of the apes. The beast was glaring toward one of the huts. Tarzan followed his gaze. To his infinite relief and delight he saw the stalwart form of Mungambi racing toward him. The huge black was panting heavily, as though from strenuous physical exertion and nervous excitement. He rushed to Tarzan's side, and as the first of the savages reached the village gate, the native's knife severed the last of the cords that bound Tarzan to the stake. In the street lay the corpses of the savages that had fallen before the pack the night before. From one of these Tarzan seized a spear and knobstick, and with Mugambi at his side and the snarling pack about him, he met the natives as they poured through the gate. Fierce and terrible was the battle that ensued, but at last the savages were routed, more by terror perhaps at sight of a black man and a white fighting in company with a panther and the huge fierce apes of a cut, than because of their inability to overcome the relatively small force that opposed them. One prisoner fell into the hands of Tarzan, and him the ape-man questioned in an effort to learn what had become of Rokoff and his party. Promised his liberty in return for the information, the black told all he knew concerning the movements of the Russian. It seemed that early in the morning their chief had attempted to prevail upon the whites to return with him to the village and with their guns destroy the ferocious pack that had taken possession of it, but Rokoff appeared to entertain even more fears of the giant white man and his savage companions than even the blacks themselves. Upon no conditions would he consent to returning even within sight of the village. Instead, he took his party hurriedly to the river, where they stole a number of canoes the blacks had hidden there. The last that they had seen of them, they had been paddling strongly upstream, their porters from Kaviri's village wielding the blades. So once more Tarzan of the Apes with his hideous pack took up his search for the ape-man's son and the pursuit of his abductor. For weary days they followed through an almost uninhabited country, only to learn at last that they were upon the wrong trail. The little band had been reduced by three, for three of Akut's apes had fallen in the fighting at the village. Now with Akut there were five great apes, and Sheeta was there, and Mungambi and Tarzan. The ape-man no longer heard rumors even of the three who had preceded Rokoff, the white man and the woman and the child. Who the man and woman were he could not guess, but that the child was his was enough to keep him hot upon the trail. He was sure that Rokoff would be following this trio and so he felt confident that so long as he could keep upon the Russian's trail, he would be winning so much nearer to the time he might snatch his son from the dangers and horrors that menaced him. In retracing their way after losing Rokoff's trail, Tarzan picked it up again at a point where the Russian had left the river and taken to the brush in a northerly direction. He could only account for this change on the ground that the child had been carried away from the river by the two who now had possession of it. Nowhere along the way, however, could he gain definite information that might assure him positively that the child was ahead of him. Not a single native they questioned had seen or heard of this other party, though nearly all had direct experience with the Russian or had talked with others who had. It was with difficulty that Tarzan could find means to communicate with the natives, as the moment their eyes fell upon his companions they fled precipitously into the bush. His only alternative was to go ahead of his pack and waylay an occasional warrior whom he found alone in the jungle. One day as he was thus engaged, tracking an unsuspecting savage, he came upon the fellow in the act of hurling a spear at a wounded white man who crouched in a clump of bush at the trail's side. The white was one whom Tarzan had often seen, and whom he recognized at once. Deep in his memory was implanted those repulsive features, the close-set eyes, the shifty expression, the drooping yellow mustache. Instantly it occurred to the ape-man that this fellow had not been among those who had accompanied Rokoff at the village where Tarzan had been a prisoner. He had seen them all, and this fellow had not been there. There could be but one explanation. He it was who had fled ahead of the Russian with the woman and the child, and the woman had been Jane Clayton. He was sure now of the meaning of Rokoff's words. The ape-man's face went white as he looked upon the pasty, vice-marked countenance of the Swede. Across Tarzan's forehead stood out the broad band of scarlet that marked the scar where, years before, 
Terkoz had torn a great strip of the ape-man's scalp from his skull in the fierce battle in which Tarzan had sustained his fitness to the kingship of the apes of Kerchak. The man was his prey. The black should not have him, and with the thought he leaped upon the warrior, striking down the spear before it could reach its mark. The black, whipping out his knife, turned to do battle with this new enemy, while the Swede, lying in the bush, witnessed a duel the like of which he had never dreamed to see, a half-naked white man battling with a half-naked black, hand to hand with the crude weapons of primeval man at first, and then with hands and teeth like the primordial brutes from whose loins their forebears sprung. For a time Anderson did not recognize the white, and then at last it dawned upon him that he had seen this giant before. His eyes went wide in surprise that this growling, rending beast could ever have been the well-groomed English gentleman who had been a prisoner aboard the Kincaid. An English nobleman. He had learned the identity of the Kincaid's prisoners from Lady Greystoke during their flight up the Ungambi. Before, in common with the other members of the crew of the steamer, he had not known who the two might be. The fight was over. Tarzan had been compelled to kill his antagonist, as the fellow would not surrender. The Swede saw the white man leap to his feet beside the corpse of his foe, and placing one foot upon the broken neck, lift his voice in the hideous challenge of the victorious bull ape. Anderson shuddered. Then Tarzan turned toward him. His face was cold and cruel, and in the gray eyes the Swede read murder. "'Where is my wife?' growled the ape-man. "'Where is the child?' Anderson tried to reply, but a sudden fit of coughing choked him. There was an arrow entirely through his chest, and as he coughed the blood from his wounded lung poured suddenly from his mouth and nostrils. Tarzan stood waiting for the paroxysm to pass. Like a bronze image, cold, hard, and relentless, he stood over the helpless man, waiting to wring such information from him as he needed, and then to kill. Presently the coughing and hemorrhaging ceased, and again the wounded man tried to speak. Tarzan knelt near the faintly moving lips. The wife and child, he repeated. Where are they? Anderson pointed up the trail. The Russian. He got them, he whispered. How did you come here? continued Tarzan. Why are you not with Rokoff? They catch us, replied Anderson in a voice so low that the ape-man could just distinguish the words. They catch us. I fight. But my men, they all run away. Then they get me when I been wounded. Rokoff say he leave me here for the hyenas. That was worse than to kill. He take your wife and kid. What were you doing with them? Where were you taking them? asked Tarzan, and then, fiercely leaping close to the fellow with fierce eyes blazing with the passion of hate and vengeance that he had with difficulty controlled, what harm did you do to my wife or child? Speak quick before I kill you. Make your peace with God. Tell me the worst or I will tear you to pieces with my hands and teeth. You have seen that I can do it. A look of wide-eyed surprise overspread Anderson's face. Why? he whispered. I did not hurt them. I tried to save them from that Russian. Your wife was kind to me on the Kincaid, and I hear that little baby cry sometimes. I got a wife and kid for my own by Christiana and I couldn't bear for to see them separated and in Rokoff's hands any more. That was all. Do I look like I've been here to hurt them? He continued after a pause, pointing to the arrow protruding from his breast. There was something in the man's tone and expression that convinced Tarzan of the truth of his assertions. More weighty than anything else was the fact that Anderson evidently seemed more hurt than frightened. He knew he was going to die, so Tarzan's threats had little effect upon him but it was quite apparent that he wished the Englishman to know the truth, and not to wrong him by harboring the belief that his words and manner indicated that he had entertained. The ape-man instantly dropped to his knees beside the Swede. "'I am sorry,' he said very simply. "'I had looked for none but knaves in company with Rokoff. I see that I was wrong. That is past now, and we will drop it for the more important matter of getting you to a place of comfort and for looking after your wounds. We must have you on your feet again as soon as possible.' Then the Swede, smiling, shook his head. "'You go on and look for the wife and kid,' he said. "'I've been as good as dead already, but,' he hesitated, "'I hate to think of the hyenas. Won't you finish up this job?' Tarzan shuddered. A moment ago he had been upon the point of killing this man. Now he could no more have taken his life than he could have taken the life of any of his best friends. He lifted the Swede's head in his arms to change and ease his position. Again came a fit of coughing and the terrible hemorrhage. After it was over, Anderson lay with closed eyes. Tarzan thought that he was dead, until he suddenly raised his eyes to those of the ape-man, sighed, and spoke in a very low, weak whisper. 
I think it blow pretty soon, pretty hard, he said, and died. End of chapter 10